Hi. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Muriel Bors Tarrant. I'm the Artistic Director of Safe Harbors, New York City, and I'm co-hosting with my favorite person here, Erin. <laughs> Introduce yourself, Erin, and we would like to, it's our closing, it's our closing event. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk to all the artists. But first, I would like to start with um, their land acknowledgement. Aaron. Yeah. Thank you, Muriel. My name is Aaron. I am the literary director and dramaturg at New York Theater Workshop. Um, one of the company, along with Lomama, we have been uh, fortunate enough to co-present the Reflections of Native Voices Festival over the last two weeks. Um, and thank you to all of the artists who are here with us today. It has been a really tremendous couple of weeks of of experiencing art and um, traveling from our, our bedrooms. Um, to start with the, I, I wanna start with a New York Theater Workshop's land acknowledgement, which we developed in conversation with Safe Harbors. Um, Manhattan has always been a gathering and trading place for many indigenous peoples, where nations intersected from all four directions since time immemorial. It was a place to gather and sometimes seek refuge during times of conflict and struggle. We pay respect to all of the ancestors past, present, to their future generations. We acknowledge that our work is situated on the island of Manhattan, Manahanet, on the island. Traditional lands of the Munsi Lenape, the Canarsi, the Ukachog, the Matenecock, the Shenecock, the Regawank, and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. We respect that many indigenous people continue to live and work on this island and acknowledge their ongoing contributions to the area. Thank you very much, Erin. And I would like to introduce a community, a longtime community member, Ben Jibo, who is going to do the opening uh, prayer for us. And, um, and also with my, one of my dearest friends. Um, and he is going to introduce himself, Ben. Aukola, Aukola, Ben Jibo, Imichi, Apie, Tios, Femi, Tawae, Wakanka, Duduta. So my name is Ben Jibo, and I'm an old member of the Yangtze Sioux tribe of South Dakota. My family unit is the Red Lightning. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here among friends and family and connecting on um, this important work that you continue to do. Um, and as we think about all the people that, you know, are with us, uh, and not with us and with us and not with us and here and there. Uh, we're always a community in flux, in change, in move. And for that, I would like to do a prayer in our traditional language of the Dakota Nation. So if you could please rise wherever you might be, because it's important to stand when we pray and um, say some words of encouragement. So, Tokashila, Munchila Puru Pila, Tokashla Makadakas. Grandmother, grandfather, we thank you for all that we have, that we're all related. We think of all those things the things that fly, the things that crawl, things, the mountains, the rivers, the lakes, the air, the minds of people. And we say, Palamia, and we ask for protection and blessing Tawuchiki. Amen. Lamia, thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Ben. And he's also on our board of Safe Harbors, and I want to acknowledge that. <laughs> and I would also just like to talk and just say one thing before we start. We did it, people. We did this festival. So we need to give each other a really big hand. We did this. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it was like doing a festival on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> So I would just like to, I don't want to talk about me. Ha ha. I, <laughs> Nick, don't say anything. Neither do you, Moses. So <laughs> I see you nibbling. Um, so let's start with our guest artists who are part and, and some people who are part of our repertory theater. And Aaron, you know, I'm going to start with um, Jasmine. 
you know, um, and she's going to tell us a little bit of her background, and then you can ask her whatever you would like to ask. So, Jasmine, I'd like to start with you. Introduce yourself, who you are, what nations do you come from, what land you're on, and, um, you know, where, you know, what you felt about moving in your piece, because you were a guest music artist, and what did that mean to you, and how we worked, and how, you know. Of course. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jasmine Goodspeed. I am of the Nipmuc people of Massachusetts. I'm currently on uh, Pakumtuk, Nunatuk land, uh, Nipmuc land. And um, I am with the Safe Harbors Ensemble. So excited to be working with everybody. Being able to collaborate with other Indigenous people is so important. Being able to see Indigenous works of art, even now during COVID, is healing and needed. So I um, just want to say that. And uh, I was part of Music Weekend, so I got to put in some songs. And <laughs> oh boy, that was... It was an experience. I have a, a bit of a recording set up here. As when COVID started, I was like, okay, I need to figure this out, how to continue doing stuff. And um, I am on TikTok a lot. So I've been picking up a lot of tips from people on there. And so I got myself a mic and MXLR and a whole little setup. And I've recorded some tracks. My songs are musical theater songs, which was very different from uh, some of the stuff that was in there. I think I was the only person who did theater songs, um, which is cool because there's not a lot of like native people in musical theater. And I think that's something to um, note and to, to think about. and. I, I would love to see more Native people in musical theater and see those opportunities presented for Native people to have. I mean, there's no reason why we aren't, why can't be casting Native people in big parts. There's no reason why we can't be putting shows on Broadway post-pandemic for Native people. These shows in this, this festival are, were good enough to be on Broadway. And I'm sure if there were, if this, there was a musical in this festival, then a, a full on like Broadway musical that could go on Broadway. And why shouldn't it? Why shouldn't there be musical theater for native people written by native people on a big stage like that? And um, that's something that I've always thought about and that has been really important to me and so so excited to participate in music weekend and present those songs um so yeah thanks, Aaron. yeah thank you do you want to uh, do you want to talk a little bit more for the, if people weren't able to catch their songs what the piece that they're from or pieces that they're from and the inspiration for for those yeah <laughs> so um uh, the first one was from a musical I wrote for my senior thesis uh, called 1675. It's a musical about my tribe's history back during King Philip's War. And the reason why I turned it into a musical in the long run was um, what music says to me are all the things that words can't. And if I were trying to write a play about all of the history, it would be, you know, an epic it would just be nine hours long. And um, there was a, a little part of me that was like, no, I want people to remember this. I want people to ball their eyes out singing these songs. Like, so I made it in this, in this way where it used some like cliche narratives to try and um, capture people and make them connect to the history easily. And so um, the first song that was, uh, that I submitted to Music Weekend was from that. It was from the main character uh, who's a member of the Praying Town in Natick, which is a whole history um, 
that I won't get into right now because I'll be talking for forever and I can talk for forever, but I won't do that. <laughs> uh, I encourage everyone to go look it up though. I encourage everyone to go research King Philip's War and Deer Island and what happened. Um, Lisa Brooks's book, Our Beloved Kin, is really good for that. And the, there's books on King Philip's War as well. I, I highly recommend doing that. It's a pivotal moment in history. Anyways, um, so it's, it's just her moment of um, internal struggle. And um, then the other two songs were from a little project that I'm doing with some people that I met on TikTok, uh, <laughs> where we were like, after Avatar The Last Airbender came out, we were like, well, what if we made a parody musical about Avatar The Last Airbender? And um, that, that happened. So it's been great working with that team and playing around with those concepts. And it also, if there was a musical about Avatar The Last Airbender, it would be an amazing opportunity for Native people in musical theater to yeah. have. Thank you. I really liked hearing, yeah, that's great. So I think that we should do the King Philip's War and we need to do it during Thanksgiving on, on um, Fifth Avenue. And I think we have to go and we have to fight on air and we have to take over Thanksgiving Day Parade. <laughs> Let's see what happens. And we should call it, I don't know, uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, a sit-in, what do they call it? It's a, a special word for it. Anyway, <laughs> that was great, Jasmine. I really liked it and I really cool. liked, what is it called? Flash mob. Yes, a flash mob of King Philip's War. We should do it live. And everyone should dress the way when we're gonna attack go beyond Fifth Avenue. But, but Jasmine, um, I really like the idea of taking things and focusing and really going to wherever we want to be as Native people. And I think that's really, really important that we're, uh, we have voices, distinct different voices. We're not all thinking the same. We're not all in the same tribes. We're not our nations. We don't all pray the same way. So everyone has, an, where I feel for Safe Harbors, everyone has an individual voice to do what they feel their work needs to be, right? So the next person I would like to call on is Moses Goods. And I'm going to just introduce him really. Where is he? Where'd he go? I'm right here. Okay. Is he embracing me? Okay. Yes, I see you. My dear friend who I love very dearly. We've known each other for years. We've wrote many things together and worked together. And I was so happy. I was getting, every year I tried to do someone from Hawaii, our sisters and brothers from the island. And Moses? Can you just tell me a little bit of, you know, your background and... Yeah, um, aloha mai kako, ova okinolo, no maui, mai au. Um, Moses, I am originally from the island of Maui, but I'm currently living on Oahu. So there are actually several islands here in the middle of the Pacific Ocean that make up the aina or the pai aina of Hawaii. Um, I'm from Maui, but currently living on Oahu in um, beautiful, though often rainy Manoa. So it might rain on me. And if, if I do, I'll go into the house. Um, anyway, I just want to start off by saying, Muriel, I love you. And I want to thank you. And I want to thank um, Safe Harbors and Aaron and New York City, um, New York Theater Workshop and Josephine and all the people that, that put this together. Thank you for doing this, because this is why I do what I do. Um, years ago, when I decided to um, have a career in theater, I was uh, I was very disappointed because, of course, there was no represent representation. I didn't see this on stage or in any script, and I didn't like that. So I made the decision to become a professional theater artist that represents who he is, which is um, which was a risky thing because it's not logical. You want to you, you really just want to you know go where the work is, but I I didn't want to do that, and so I started this this mission to to do what I do, and now more things are happening and more spaces are available for us to come together and talk about our work and see each other and support each other. And I just thank you guys so much for continuing to do this. Last year you had Hailey at the festival and her amazing um, group. And this year you have me and I'm so thankful for this opportunity to, co to connect with all of these amazing indigenous artists. Um, what else was I supposed to talk about? My work? Oh, Pete, yes, your work. <laughs> 
my work. Okay, so thank you for for bringing up Duke, which is the 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 piece that was featured in in the the festival this year. Duke is was actually one of the um, it's a piece I created back in 2015. So I've been performing that for a while, touring it here and there. And when you called me and said, "Okay, I want you to to um, uh, record one of your shows," I'm like, "Well, just so happens that we actually." Um, put a team together and got a nice recording of it because although I've been an independent artist for for years, right before the pandemic started, I went back to um, working with the Honolulu Theater for Youth, which is kind of a theater I always go back to because they've helped me along the way so much and they'd commissioned me to write another piece. So I'm like, well, I'll just spend a year, you know, back with them um, as an artistic associate. And then the pandemic hit, I'm like, Whew, because had that not happened, I would have been completely out of work because all of my gigs as an independent artist would have, they were gone. And this children's theater um, wasted no time in switching from, you know, performing on stage to developing content for, um, uh, for the internet and for TV. We actually came up with a television show that we did two seasons of. So, you know, we didn't know what we were doing. We're a bunch of theater artists just kind of figuring out how to, what's a, what's a camera angle? What is, what's a zoom and all this, but we did it. And we have, we have, um, you know, we have a, a TV show that um, we're, we're looking to continue. But anyway, that's sort of how I got, uh, how I'm getting through the pandemic. But of course that is not the extent of my work. I still do um, my own, my own work, not just children's theater, of course, um, but even that, is you know I, I'm I just got some money to get some a couple more cameras and to really figure out how these things work because uh, Jasmine you're talking about TikTok I mean I'm I'm about to be 44 years old I don't know nothing about no TikTok so I went and got a TikTok account and I'm like how does this work so I, I got rid of that so I'm gonna I'm gonna stick to like I got a I got a YouTube channel and other things that I can kind of you know that kind of makes a little more sense to my old brain. But this is such a weird place that we're in as theater artists trying to figure out how to do our work in other ways on TV, you know, on in social media. And I'm enjoying much of it, but much of it scares me because this is this we're so out of our, our realm. But for the most part, I'm, I'm just going to make the best of it and just just give it a go, which I which I have been. Um, did I talk about my work now? <laughs> Aaron. <laughs> yeah, ask me another question, Aaron. Ask him another question. I guess, I mean, as was true with so many of you, I the work translated so beautifully from one medium that to the, another medium. I'm curious if you wanted to talk a little bit about the process and what it was like to go from the stage show um, to the, the beautiful film that you made. You know, I talk about, about how, how, how hesitant and fearful we are as theater artists to, to make this switch. But then you got to remind yourself, we are, we are artists. We, we know what we can do and we know what we do is pretty good, you know? So you just got to trust your strengths and yeah, there's going to be some adjustment to, to, to doing different things, but just know that, you know, I've been creating art for, for, well, I don't want to date myself, but for a really long time. So I, I have, I, I know a thing or two. And luckily along the way I had, be, I, out of necessity, I became a playwright. I started off as an actor. But because the stories weren't being told, I had to write my own stuff. So I became a writer over the years. And now, you know, that's that's um, kind of what I'm leading towards a little bit more is more, you know, more of an opportunity to to, to write uh, for myself, but for others as well. And just really digging into what I already um, have have laid in terms of the foundation of, of my art and just leaning leaning into that because it's not going to be the same. It's not going to be what we what we created, but it's going to be something entirely different. And much of it is going to be beautiful. Some of it ain't going to be beautiful. I'll tell you that much. But you know, a lot of it is going to be pretty amazing work. And you know, the thing is, we're we're resilient as actors, right? As as, as artists, and we're going to keep doing what we do because, you know, most importantly, like a, you know, to go back to what I said before, we're here to represent who we are. You know, we have to do this work. It's all, it's not you know, it's not a choice. You know, we we've committed to serving our communities. We've committed to telling these stories, to putting our heroes on stage, literally, right? And so it's not like I, I can just not do something. I gotta do it. It's my kuleana. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And we've had many discussions about how, 
you know, how do we see excellence and what does that mean? And, you know, how do we train youth? Me and you both were talking about when we were doing the Institute together. How do we do that training respectfully? How do we change going into different um, realms with, uh, you know, the sometimes a very racist realm of theater? And we talked about, we had huge discussions on how you change that particular paradigm. And when we, I think, it, yeah, me and you were talking about that some things aren't pretty because birth itself is not pretty. If you think about it, it's beautiful, yes, but it's not, you know, it's messy and, you know, mm -hmm. and birth and, and to relook at, you know, I mean, birth is the only thing to, to really think. Um, and I loved your piece, Moses. I loved your, you know, when you did the native, the, the native <laughs> Jim Thorpe. And I really liked, you know, that our whole idea and then you had to go and do the fake Indian shows, which was very funny. <laughs> so the next person I would like to I'll call on is Santee, who's a very, very, uh, you know, old family friend. And, you know, we've been dying to work with each other for a very long time. And I would just like for her to introduce herself and to um, land she's on in her work. Santee? Ego, Scano, Santi Smith, Dagalunyakwa, Nyungnyats, Kongwehoi, Ganyangehaga, Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. Hi, everyone. I, my name is Santi. Uh, my Haudenosaunee name is Dagalunyakwa, which means picking up the sky in Ganyangeha, the Mohawk language. I'm home at Six Nations right now, and I've been here grounded in cocooning since last March. Um, I was on tour and our tour got cut short due to the pandemic. And so it's really nice to be able to connect with everyone. Yeah, I'm Muriel for uh, helping and get, you know, everybody connected and it's great to meet new people. And, um, and happy to present uh, Blood, Water, Earth, which was uh, International Indigenous Women's Collaboration. I've been doing a lot of work um, as a triptych series on um, uh, based around um, indigenous women creators and Blood, Water, Earth was sort of like a remix of some of the um, Im beautiful images by Louise Patiki Bryant, who is um, Maori from uh, Aotearoa. So she was one of my main collaborators with her beautiful imagery and that Im that those photo, the video we, we shot in Aotearoa, which is kind of like my second home and um, really missing it because I was supposed to be there all of December working on a creation lab with other collaborators. So uh, I was happy to be able to share that with, with you and, and the um, Safe Harbors audience, my mama audience and, um, Happy that we did get to work together and unfortunately not there because I love coming to New York City and I was there last year uh, in January for the ISPA conference and, and, you know, really wanting to connect out with, with more with people. So this was an online opportunity. So now go. Aaron. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Your piece was also so um, beautiful and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the creation of the piece. I love the multimedia elements of it and the, the, the water in it. And I'm curious about how you built the piece before it was recorded. Um, so Blood, Water, Earth, we premiered in 2018 at the Woodland Cultural Center. So all of the elements that you saw in the video, including the pool of water, was, was developed progressively from the premiere. And um, it's toured in and uh, went to into um, the Auckland Arts Festival last year. And so the opportunity came up in, in September to do a, um, a hybrid performance. So we had uh, live streamed it through Celebration of Nations First Ontario Performing Arts Festival. And so it was already and we recorded it at that time because, you know, we and it was on Six Nations. Uh, so one thing I've learned about the pandemic is, and un, which is really great, is that Six Nations has everything that I need. <laughs> we have tech people, we have an AV studio, we have musicians, we have recording studios, we have artists and collaborators. So we shot that, performed that live stream and recorded it at Through the Red Door, which is an AV tech company. And um, 
And uh, so, you know, I brought I my goal when, for my company, which I didn't introduce, was Gahawi Dance Theatre. Uh, work uh, with about, I would say, 90% Indigenous hires and collaborators. So even my stage manager, Lindy, he was able to come uh, to work on that. And basically, they we were able to transform their um, site. So we made the little stage because it was on the cement floor. It was sort of like a sound studio. And then we got, uh, you know, the large... Um, Basically, it was a white plastic tarp, which we did the projections on. Um, and uh, I had asked Lindy Kenoshimig to expand the pool area because I really, water is such an important part of that. And in the video, I was we were in the pool of water, um, a runoff pool from the ocean um, at uh, Kerikeri. And uh, so that connection to water and birthing and women in womb water uh, was really important and cleansing and purification and in uh, the reflectiveness of it and the darkness of it moving into sort of dark waters and the possibility of, of um, potential potentiality and um, for me as an artist, I really love imagery. I'm, I, I think very in cinematically and with a lot of design. So doing that and creating that space was was really fun for, for me to uh, finally get a big pool. And then I'm like, the next time it's gonna be a bigger pool and it's gonna be water and I'm gonna be in water everywhere. So what you've got to see is um, the recording. And then uh, Shane Paulos is also from Six Nations. He, he did an edit for us specifically for uh, the festival. So that was great. It was perfect timing to be able to share that again. I really loved uh... <laughs> You know, I was looking at, it really reminded me of um, metaphor, metaphor, metaphoric, 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 metaphor, whatever. It reminded me of this, uh, what, metaphoric, metamorphosis, metamorphosis. Remember metamorphosis on Broadway? <laughs> this is how, this is how far it happens to me every time at the end of this festival. It doesn't matter. I called, <laughs> this always happens to me. Do you remember that on uh, Broadway, Aaron, with the pool, and they did all those Greek stories? Yes, the Mary's right. Theater, yeah. yeah, yeah, it really not, you know, and I really liked that idea, Santi, that, you know, that it's the original people, the original idea. So, you know what I mean? So you see where, like, they kind of took that idea of us with water and wombs and telling story, telling old stories and how do we come out of the water and telling those stories within the water and how our waterways are so important to us, you know, for those of us who are on the East Coast and especially, you know, and, and you know, because I come from an island people too, like those are very, very important stories. And I saw that why I particularly picked this piece with Moses too is because there are these water stories. There's all these water stories. There's all these water stories that come out with each other. And I like that idea that indigenous peoples, no matter where we are, you know, no matter where we are, we have one thing in common that is borderless, right? And that is that we can talk about our survival from the land and it not always this downtrodden story, you know, and it was this wonderful uplifting story on both birth and then, you know, you had Duke, you know, and it's like these wonderful stories on how you mend them and how we see each other um, as native peoples, right, or uh, as indigenous peoples, right. So the next, um, and I love both of your pieces, they were wonderful, 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 you know, <clears throat> can't get it out of my head. <laughs> and the next person I would like to call on is Nick Billy. Um, we're going to go a little bit into um, Nick Billy. Uh, let me explain Nick for a second. Um, Nick Billy has been, we have been uh, partners, <laughs> partners in crime and collaborators for how many years, Nick? Probably about 30. Five years? Something like that. Something like that. And we met with Ben Jibo as dancers. <laughs> and we've been working with each other since, oh, yeah, for a very long time. 
And so he is also a founder of Safe Harbors. He's also a founder of Don't Feed the Indians, um, the, the piece. And he's also a founder of uh, the Repertory Theater. Um, and he's also a, uh, he's also a, my associate director. And I would like to introduce Nick Billy. And there you go, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Nick Billy, I'm Choctaw Muskogee from Oklahoma. Um, it's Jay Stongoa is saying hello in Choctaw and Muskogee. Um, yeah, it's been, first of all, whew, you know, what, a, what an experience to have, you know, to do all this virtually. Um, thank you to Safe Harbors, everybody in Safe Harbors, including uh, individuals like Ben Jibo, who is a board member. Uh, Jared Packard, who's also a board member, um, to New York Theater Workshop and La Mama, and also to each one of you on this panel. You're all amazing individuals. And I'm so grateful to have shared this virtual space with you because it does show, as each of you have been mentioning, is that there, we're all diverse, we're not monolithic, and we all have different ways, different expressions, different creative processes, practices that are really important to, for the, the world to see. And, um, but as far as being working with Muriel, um, Josie, Pam, um, Danielle, uh, for Don't Feed the Indians, that is a show that was really does show the diversity of native people and that we all don't look alike. We're all different shapes and sizes. Uh, touching on colorism, we're a little bit, uh, you know, we're all different shades of nativeness, of indigenousness. And, uh, and I think that's really important for the world to see and that we don't, we're not just uh, bur uh, beads, feathers, and little bitty tom-toms going, hey, ya, yeah, hey, ya, yeah, hey, ya. Yeah. We do that very well when we do it, but it's not, that's not who we are. Um, so, and creating, um, creating Don't Feed the Indians, a divine comedy pageant. First of all, I want to say I miss Kevin, and I wish he were here. And he is. So, um, uh, but it was creating that together collaboratively, creating stories through improvisation and um, what was a hard process for us, but it was also a necessary process. And it was a very important learning experience. And it also created community, uh, which is, uh, we shared a lot, you know, we share the work we share, the piece we share, everything. So that for me was important because it, it created community. Um, let me just move into the piece that I did um, called Stajada, which means Indian in Muskogee. And um, that was a, that was a challenge. It was a very positive challenge though, good learning experience because Danielle Soames, who was the director, uh, thankfully, she was the director and helped me a lot. We had very little time to transition from it being a stage piece to a filmed performance piece. And because I work full time and I just came home from work and Ben is at work, uh, he's, <laughs> he's at Bellevue. And um, so it was, it was a challenge to, to really um, create a, a film piece where we had no time to transition that the stage piece into it. We filmed it in one day. We, it was completely, all, all the scenes, all the five scenes were filmed within like between 10.30 in the morning and 3.30 in the afternoon. And it was on a zero budget. And, um, uh, and it was just, and it was cold out. We did it outside, so it was 34 degrees. But so it was, it was a challenge. The other part of this, uh, and this is kind of like when we did the fireside chat too, is that this is my first offering of uh, my, my perform, I like to call it my performance stuff. And uh, <laughs> uh, it's my first offering. And I'm so grateful that, it, that I, I could do it with Safe Harbors who had my back all the way. Thank you, Safe Harbors. New York Theater Workshop, thank you so much. Uh, to you panelists too for being here. 
Um, so it was, it was truly a challenge, but it was also one that I felt was necessary because uh, as I spoke about in the fireside chat, um, I'm willing to challenge my own sense of native stasis. And, uh, through, and through doing this piece, I'm hopefully um, pushing toward and pushing into an unconventional form, a, a form, unconventional form of thriving. So, uh, because we native people do thrive, and indigenous people do thrive regardless. And, you know, resilience and thriving, depending on the dictionary you get it from, uh, it all is sort of westernized. But I think that we native people, indigenous people can reframe that and uh, do, and all of you performers, all of the artists on this panel have, are doing that. So thank you, I appreciate that. And I'm not alone in this. But uh, I also would like to ask uh, Danielle, for her thoughts um, as being the director and how difficult and demanding I was. <laughs> so I'm just gonna turn that over to Danielle. Is that okay? Uh, I, you already did, so I don't know. You asked me <laughs> <this> before. <laughs> Let me just introduce Danielle thing. for a second. I just <laughs> want to say that Danielle is also a founding member of Safe Harbors, and there was a time when Safe Harbors was only me, Nick, Danielle, and Kevin, and Josephine when she wasn't in school. So when we say we're founding members, there was literally the four of us in a cold room with no heat at one point. <laughs> so um, Danielle, introduce yourself and um, talk about, you know, Don't Feed the Indians and what it means to the transition from directing because I have been the main director for most of the pieces, but now I feel it's important that we have other native directors, that it can't just be one person all the time. There has to be us to continue to have people talk in our voices, you know, in our own voices. So Danielle. Hi, hello everyone. Uh, My name is Danielle Soames. I'm Mohawk of Kahnawake. Um, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, and also in New York City. Um, I'm thrilled to be a part of this. I would say that Muriel is a great director and learning from her and her style, as well as um, storytelling and ensemble work has been a blessing to me because it really helped me uh, channel some of my directing um, uh, mannerisms. And I would say, um, I'm really happy to have directed Nick Billy's piece, Stajada. That was like a wonderful experience between him and I. And I would say that we had challenges um, that we didn't know we would have to deal with. Um, there was the environmental challenge. There was um, uh, challenges with editing. There was challenges with uh, sound. There was challenges with like little, um, <laughs> cars going by and I mean everything you can name happened like chickens and dogs and and people talking in the background and then machinery I was like oh my goodness thank goodness we have these mics because if we didn't have these sound canceling mics we would have heard every single thing um, so adding sound and layering um, was a definite uh, addition to um, cancel out any of those outside um, noises, I would say. Um, but it also um, forced us to be laser focused uh, with time. So I created um, a very tight schedule that we actually ended up finishing um, quite early because we just kept going. But in that, um, we were quite exhausted by the end. And um, if I had it to do again, I would say that I would go back and maybe split um, the, the filming into two days instead of one full day. But because like Nick said, our schedules, he was working, I was working, Ben was working. So all of us had our conflicts and we had a very tight schedule. We had to just do it. And we said, let's get it done. So we rehearsed for um, about a month, once a week uh, in my apartment. Um, and uh, it was good that we did that. And then when we went to do the location scouting um, at Ben's house, 
uh, I filmed part of it so that I could easily translate um, to the videographer what I wanted to see as far as setting up shots. Um, and luckily I took a class at, um, at um, oh gosh, what's that school called? Oh, um, School of Visual Arts. I, I took a class at School of Visual Arts in documentary filmmaking and I had to create a film there and took a, a class in um, um, Final Cut Pro. But editing is its own set of um, skills. And um, I don't have it. Uh, I, I would say that once I, once I um, receive noise canceling um, headphones, thanks to my husband, he gave me noise canceling headphones. I heard everything. And then once I heard everything, I was like the nitpicky director of, okay, right here, this second to that second, I knew this second to that second. I probably drove our editor crazy, but you know, it, it, it is like tech. Um, when you're in theater tech, uh, tech week, it's hell week. And so I just equated it to that. And I just said, listen, it's like tech. We got to add sound, we got to add lights. We have to really create the element that this is happening right now and add that um, sense of storytelling where it could translate into film. And it, it, it felt like we were just making a film, but I know that it was, um, it was theater into film. Um, I would say that I, I was surprised um, by the outcome. I was happily surprised. And, um, I, you know, I think that when you don't have skill sets that you go to school for, there's a lot of self-doubt that comes into play. And I definitely had a lot of self-doubt and questioning, is this how it should be done? I don't know. Is this how it should be translated? And the thing is, what's beautiful about this festival is that variety is the spice. So this is what makes all of our individual pieces so unique and so inspiring to others is that we all come from different nations and we're bringing together our stories. We're bringing together each other's stories, but we're creating them in different styles and elements that maybe we didn't even know existed within ourselves. And then it translated into the, um, the vision of, of this beautiful uh, performance piece that then is on film. And now we have this as an archive to continue for the future, which normally in theater, you don't have that as an archive unless you get permission for it. But this, we automatically had to have permission. So I think for that, it really lends a lot to each of us because now we have it as part of our portfolio and we can continue that moving forward and creating new things. But um, Don't Feed the Indians has been, uh, has been like a little love child of, of all of ours. Um, it started off with um, uh, Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson. Uh, I don't know if Muriel wants to talk a little bit about that, but we were all pissed off uh, at, this, at this piece. Um, because you know it, it, it really spoke true to um, what we are against stereotypes and making fun of history. And it was just one joke too many that we created oops, bloody, bloody, oops, <laughs> as a farce to um, bloody, bloody Andrew Jackson. And then from that sparked the idea of don't feed the Indian, the divine comedy pageant. And um, it, it really was uh, something that we all came together, um, almost like we're, we have our own club and here we are uh, talking. We had a lot of discussions um, to create the script and um, we tried a lot of uh, scenes out and we had a lot of fun and we laughed so much. And I think that when we went on the road, we, we realized that now we're traveling with this piece that started off as a seed, just an idea. And then here we are, it has come to fruition and we can share it with everyone. So I really am uh, happy to be a part of it. And, and I, I also miss Kevin very much. And I do think he's with us and um, looking over us right now. So I'm really thankful for New York Theater Workshop, for Safe Harbors, for coming together. Um, our meetings that we would have to bring Safe Harbors um, as an idea into reality, seeing that this festival has become reality uh, is amazing. And it just shows that if you put your mind to something and if you have the right set of people that also are of the same 
mind and spirit that they want the same things, your dreams can come true. So I would say to everyone watching this that um, don't give up. And even in this time of visual artistry, uh, keep at your work and try new things, see what's out there, learn, because this is a time that we can actually come together and create something beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. I was hoping, Josephine, that we could bring you into the conversation to talk about um, both Don't Feed the Indians from your perspective and also something that Muriel has said is that uh, TP Tales came out of Don't Feed the Indians. And so maybe we can talk a little bit with Amber and Muriel and you about how one became the other. Yeah, so, you know, my experience with Don't Feed the Indians, I played Moon Knight Child and, you know, um, we first started it, you know, when we did Oops Bloody Bloody, that was like, my first year in college, which, you know, was a conservatory program, American Musical Dramatic Academy, so at AMDA, which is, uh, you know, really, which is a program Jasmine is familiar with. I always like throw her in there with it, but, you know, it's, uh, it's a conservatory and it's like, you know, very hardcore on like making sure that like somebody in this program is going to get on Broadway and like that's like your curriculum. So, you know, you're from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. kind of vibe and it's just musical theater in New York City. And that's all that's all, that is your what you're consumed with. Right. Um, so my first year, you know, very much like how like Moses was saying uh, when he was talking is like, yeah, like what, going into it. I'm like, oh, there's got to be musicals out there. There has to be something. But there's not like newsflash. Anyone who's watching doesn't exist. So, you know, I was like a whole thing. Like I was all excited. And it's so strange when I think about it in retrospect, because like I come from obviously like a theater family and, you know, I was still I was already like, you know, doing readings and stuff like that. And I was surrounded by a theater community. But like still like this optimism in your brain is like you know, this little like white ingenue, like that could be me, but you know, it doesn't. <laughs> so anyways, um, that was the program I was going through and in school, like that was like a big thing that I learned. I was just like, oh snap, like there's really nothing for us, you know? And I just came from a very like different background. Like, honestly, I wasn't used to like that many non-Brown people in a capacity of like classrooms and like 24 seven. And then like these like suit, like these super racist musicals. And so then we worked on Oops, Bloody, Bloody at the same time. So it was kind of like an insight to like, I was having like this downtown insight to like what's going on in the theater world. And then I was going to like my school, which was located uptown. And like, it's kind of like more life, like for New York people, there's like uptown, there's downtown. You know what I mean? They're like two completely different worlds. And that's how it felt it was just like, this is not real. Like, this is not okay. And just to see just like the, the, the ignorance on my teachers end and my curriculums end, like they really, it was such a blind, blind eye. They really just, it did not occur to them, like that there are more than, you know what I mean? Uh, like, I guess like white leading people and then background brown people really. So it was like this whole thing. And that was my first experience into it. And I, so I really started learning about the tropes and then like, in some ways it kind of helped me because I was able to study a lot of these tropes because I had access to like, you know, AMDA and I had access to all these musicals and all these books and like you could, and these recordings and you could look at the tropes. And so in some ways, and I'm like, my teachers hated me and, you know, I wasn't like the most like well-liked student, but I had a lot of information on like all of these things from like just being able to study them. So when I came out of school, it's like, I already knew what was like, what, what's happening, this is what's going on, right? And that was great about it. And then when we did Don't Feed the Indians and we actually like finalized on a script and we did it at La Mama, like that was a really great time for me because that was like, you know, I had developed this part basically and then I was able to do it. And it was just, it was an amazing feeling. It was an amazing time. Like for me, it was like the beginning beginnings of like my adult grown up career. That's like outside of school, outside of free readings. You know what I mean? This is the first time I was like being paid and doing this. And like, you know, it was a big thing for me. And, and career wise, I had a lot of opportunities after that. So it did, it, it was kind of like a catalyst into me continuously doing work. Um, and then going into TP tail. So then simultaneously, I guess it'd be about three or four years ago, Muriel started where Muriel was my mother, but she started working on a, um, 
she started working on her newest one woman show, right? And at the time we went, there's a lot of different names. There was a lot of different things we were going through, but she started development um, up at Dartmouth. And we had come from the Directing and Ensemble Institute out of Minneapolis. So it's like, we we're already really on like the same wavelength about what she was trying to do and what she was talking about. And, um, you know, I helped her kind of co-write in the beginning, not co-write, more so like, a, what is that called? Dictating, right? So she's talking and I'm taking notes, right? I think that's what's called. Okay. But anyways, basically scribing, scribing. That's what I was doing. So I was scribing for her at the beginnings. And oh my gosh, we had these stories. We just thought they were so entertaining. Like we had this whole gypsy story. We were just telling my grandmother about it, about like my grand and apparently it was like super racist, but obviously like me and her were not aware. Like the only thing I'd seen is like my big fat American gypsy wedding, which I love. I'm addicted to reality TV. So it's like, we came into it with this whole thing. And then everyone at Dartmouth's like, that's really racist, actually. We're like, oh, okay. So it was like, we had all of these really insane stories. There was Gladys who was cut out of the final script. You know, Gladys was a white woman who was friends with my mother's grandmother and they used to dress her up and she was awful actually, but she had money and she would give our family money for gigs. So it was just like, we had some really interesting stories in there but you know more so looking at the scope of the story a lot of those things got cut and that was kind of my beginning into me working with her and then we went up to double edge and i participated in it in double edge and then my dad was directing it and then so for this time um you know a little bit my catalyst you know my original plan was as a producer of the festival was like, you know, for Nick and my mother, they were the only ones who didn't already have pre-recorded pieces. So I was like, you know, we're going to go into New York theater workshop. We'll use the theater while it's empty. So it'll still be recorded theater. And that whole plan just kind of backfired. Cause then, you know, later on, like, you know, New York theater workshops kind of like dragging their feet. Like we don't really want to like do that. And I'm like, what is the problem? Like, I'm not understanding, like no one's going to be in there. And then they were like, yeah, we had to put in a new ventilation system. So no one's been in there since pre pandemic. And I'm just like, what? And then I was like, okay, this isn't going to work. Like we can't have, we can't put people at risk in a building that no one's like been in. And you know what I mean? And it, it was like a whole, like we really had to think about it. And then I understood like, okay, now I get why New York Theater Workshop didn't really want to do this. So kind of went back to like, okay, we're back in the environment. Like now we got to do environmental pieces. So we have to start to think about that. And, you know, for the TB Tales team, um, it was me. Who I, I co-directed and I was mostly on as the produce on the producing end and then um, Amber was co-directing and that's Amber Ball in the corner and I'm about to throw some of this to her because you know she, we can talk for days about this and um, we also had Sarah Bailey who was the cinematographer and then she came with a production assistant uh, Gracie Burwell and Gracie is actually someone I went to AMDA with and Sarah's her girlfriend and she moved to Brooklyn and like Sarah is a great cinematographer and I was like let's like make this happen so it ended up kind of being fun in that way but you know Sarah is such a responsible person that she's like I'm not going to film people inside like I don't feel safe about it like and it was like okay so we ended up doing all of it outside and like oh my gosh like it was like two days we we're supposed to do it right after New Year's and then like there was a COVID scare and that a lot of times like with the production of the festival there was a lot of COVID scares and it was something like we really had to be mindful of like we can't I'm not going to force people to do something outside of their comfort zone and their responsibility when it comes to COVID-19, because like, as we know, as native people in this country, we've been devastated by it. So it's like, I can't, I can't do that. I don't feel morally okay doing that. So there was a lot of like complications behind the scenes, like phone calls, like so-and-so's mom has COVID. So we got to cancel filming this day. And it was like, oh my gosh, like new year's and like Christmas was like insane for me. I was like, oh my goodness, like what's going to happen? Are we going to have pieces? And, um, Basically, we ended up having to push it back a, a weekend for the filming of TV Tales because of that. So it was already cold, but it was like extra brick because it was like, it was January now and it was cold as hell. Like it was so cold. I felt like, oh my gosh. And like, plus like, so we basically squoze it all into two days and Amber, who is my co-director, you know, me and her can talk about the process of it, which was also pretty insane. Very similar to Nick and Danielle. We had no idea what we were talking about. And like, one thing I think is kind of a funny story is like me and Amber, 
um, you know, Sarah, who's like a real cinematographer, she's like, oh, can you guys put together a shot list? And me and Amber are like, what is the shot list? So we don't look it up. We don't do anything. We're just like, okay, let's write a shot list. So we just start typing away. And we're like, okay, right here when she says this, do this. And right here, and it was like literally like five shots on it, right? So we give it to Sarah and Sarah's like, uh, what are you guys talking about? And we're like, we sent you the shot list. Like, what are you, what, what else are we supposed to do? And then we finally looked up what a shot list was and then like we read back through and we're like wow this was very unspecific it was very it was like literally like when she says danced wide shot when she says go close up like it made no sense at all didn't talk about location didn't say where we were didn't have a schedule like it was crazy so I'm going to pass this over to Amber to talk more about like you know what I mean pretty much the process of TP Tales but you know it was a good time we made it happen another thing I said to Sarah was like I'm not going to lie it's very beautiful we're talking to her and the editor I was like but when I was there in person because I'm like a theater person right like I don't really know anything about film I'm trying to learn I was like it felt real ghetto like it looked real ghetto to me and I was thinking in my head like oh my gosh what is this going to look like like this is not looking good to me because because you're looking at it in person and Sarah's like, yeah, but that's not it. You got to understand, look through the monitor. And I was just sitting there shaking my head like, I don't know how this is going to come out, you guys. Like, because basically I had to be on set and Amber wasn't on set because there was only one person in New York, right? Gosh, it was so complicated. But I'll have Amber talk more about like the script and the real ideas behind it. I just orchestrated it. So go ahead, Amber. And I'm wearing earrings Amber made me today on purpose. See? So glad you got them. They look wonderful. I could not, I did not know those were mine. I was ah. like, those are very nice earrings. <laughs> yeah, this whole process was like a puzzle, but we didn't actually know if we had the right pieces, if it was from the same game, if they were facing the right way. Um, so it was literally just going along and piecing everything together. Um, but yeah, the way it started was actually um, last year when I saw the the piece for the first time at um, 2019's Reflections in a Voices Festival, or is that 2020? That was 2020, that was last year. <laughs> yeah, the way I watched it and the way it was set up, um, in my mind, for some reason, it kept popping up that it was already this pilot show. That was gonna be like this series of adventures of like young girl in 1970s Brooklyn and all these people just popping in like Gladys at some point, like Gladys comes to dinner. <laughs> so like in my head, I was like, this is interesting the way this can like span out and like create all these like different series and adventures. So when it came to this year, it, it made sense, I guess, to like have this kind of like film version, cinematic pilot experience of it. Um, but we did not know how that would build or what that would look like. But the best reference that Muriel was giving us was also like Mean Streets. Um, mean Streets, Mean Streets, the montage. It's like, if there's one thing we have to get right, it's the opening intro and the montage. So that's like where some of our inspiration came from too. And Muriel was like, this is your script too. So if you wanted to talk about like the process and inspiration. Okay. Uh, well, you know, the one thing we did is it's the first time, well, it's the first time doing this piece without my husband because he was the director, he was the dramaturg and everything. So I knew he couldn't be, because he was on stage with me and we, I, I was talking to Morgan Janice, she's probably listening right now, um, who was my dramaturg and she kept on saying, you're gonna have to rechange the script if we're going to do it. So we talked about that a lot and she, and the first thing that Morgan told Amber was, don't forget Muriel lies. And she lies about the script all the time. She'll make believe she wrote something, she didn't write something, and then say, oh, I forgot it. She, says, she is the one writer who's always taking her stuff out. If it was up to her, you'd have a page. And then she says, I have to memorize this. And I do, I say that, right. And they kept on catching me, right? And I forgot I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't director at one point and I'd say to Josephine, Josephine say, why are you doing that? I said, Amber told me to, and she would call up Amber and she would say, did you tell my mother that? She's like, I never said that. And they would both like yell at me. <laughs> that was quite she my life. Just saying, she kept calling cut. She'd be like, okay, cut, start over. Like, no. <laughs> I forgot I wasn't directing. So I didn't like the way it looked. So I would say, okay, cut. I don't know, like that. And then she, and <laughs> Josephine would scream from the other end. She'd be like, you are not directing this piece. 
<laughs> so that was an adjustment, right? And <laughs> <laughs> and I would cut out lines like crazy. And then uh, Morgan, who's watched it, said, I missed some things. Yes. <laughs> so I was like, because I have a script this big, I was like, I have to memorize all these lines. My God, you know. <laughs> so, you know, and I'm so used to doing that. And but I saw what I what I really liked about it in general. And I and I think in with everybody's piece, not just this piece. What I liked about it is that we saw people who wanted to fit into their into the business of the, the business of what we call showbiz. Every one of us, we tried, we tried, you know, the dance world, you know, everything, you know, we tried the musical theater world, we tried. And what we all created was pieces that can talk about our own experience and do and taking all that training that so called Western training and taking that and making it our own right and I felt that very, very important and what I think is very cool about this too is that we see another generation right coming up. With all of these pieces we see these storytelling in works of another generation coming up and how. Most of us who are parents center or, or some of us who come from conservatory, you know, we had to take a lot of this type of bullshit from people saying you don't look Indian, you know, you're too fat to be an ingenue, all of that type of stuff, right? And we kind of made a place for that. And I think what why I did Safe Harbors, Don't Feed the Indians, Teepee Tales, it was several things, but to me, they're always connected, is one of them is that I was a mom and I had a, a, me and my husband both, I had, we were parents and we had a child coming from conservatory theater, right? And so the same things that were said to us were being said to her. And then we would have, me and him would have discussions, like I would coach Josephine on weekends, right? And there were times she didn't want to be there. I'd say, you have to stay, just get the technique and do it down. But me and my husband were saying, how many of these programs does this happen to a native? This happen to a native kid, where they and this is happening to a native young person, where they have a supportive family. What is it like for the ones who don't have support? And that was the whole idea with don't behind don't feed the Indians. How do we get the musical support, the stage managing support? How do we bring people into it? You know, um, and, and how important that is, right? Um, and so from TP Tales, I felt the same thing, bringing the director's labs that people who I've worked with or trained myself to give them the same thing with Jasmine, give them the steering wheel, right? And we started that last year. We started that, well, this is it. I'll come in. I will look at what you need to do. And then I'll just give you advice, but it's your piece. You know, if you're having real struggling problems, you know, that's what I'm here for. Right. And really trying to develop that shadow method, that shadow methodology. So really, that is what I really loved about everything here. Danielle, too. Danielle started in a, a, as an ensemble and Nick had this piece and he really <clears throat> and I, I we and him had huge discussions because we were writing the same time we were doing Don't Feed the Indians. Right. And we had these discussions about how to, you know, what do we do with all this other work? And what came out of Don't Feed the Indians came out of Director's Lab, three, well, three one-person shows and, an ensemble, and, and to have a complete repertory theater ensemble and this festival, right? So I feel that's what I feel. It was all interconnected and it all sprouted into one another. Um, we're at 5.32, so, um, Aaron, do you want to um, ask some questions or? Sure. Well, I want to invite anybody who is watching to, to ask some questions and they will get them to us as well. I just want to make sure people know that that avenue is open. Um, and I also just want to call into this space, um, everything is a circle looking for tiger lily and death and morning after, which were yes. equally uh, as brilliant and moving as all the pieces that you all made. So just to bring in the the range of the, the tremendous range of the work that you you all did to put this put this together. Um, I mean, I have many questions. I'm curious. Is you know what were people? What was people's experience of 
seeing this body of work in conversation with with each other if anybody wants to speak to that so i sort of um um i i, I binge watched a little last night because i hadn't seen a lot well in my defense, I'd seen a number of the pieces already. I saw Don't Be the Indians in New York a few years ago. I saw I saw Anthony's piece. So I'm familiar with a lot of the work that was there, but not all of it. So last night I'm like, I, I need to be watching this. So I'm binge watching things. And I'm so glad that I, that I did because it, the, the work is just, man, it's incredible. Um, Nick and, and Danielle, you talked about doing that in one day and being unsure of what, it, that ugly brown, man, that, Lord me, that was that was such a powerful. Just that your whole piece, but just just things in, in the in the work that's been created by people that I know and I'm connected to is just so encouraging. That you know, look at look at look at my native brothers and sisters doing what they do. Muriel, I mean Muriel is Muriel. She's gonna be Muriel no matter what. But Muriel on the stoop of the house where she grew up is something next level. Muriel, right? <laughs> and I, I've already known about you know when I met you, Muriel. It was at the the gathering had you. Yeah, Josephine, your daughter, and your mother, and your aunt, all in the same space, and I'm like, whoa, this is nativeness happening right in front of me. Where because we're it's it's, it's about our family, right? It's, it's about our genealogy, and there were three generations of you there. And then to see your piece, and you talk about your grandmother, and add that, and just like look at what's happening to end with with Josephine dancing and doing her thing. It was just like, whoa, look look at this. And this is what native people do. And we talk about where we're from and where we're going and the next generation and the, and the past generation and it all being the same thing. It was just um, a wonderful experience for me to binge watch things last night. And I'm so glad that I did, but I just, uh, all I can say is I'm so happy to be in this space where this work is being created and I'm a part of it. I'm, I'm making new friends and hopefully we'll all work together and do things together and keep meeting in circles like this, because I just, I just love it. Um, Santi, do you have any, any reflections on, on the festival as a whole? To be honest, I'm going to have to binge what's after. Um, <laughs> my company is, uh, we just actually launched on Friday, our own online, um, uh, work um, offering. So I've been occupied with that for the whole past while and doing as the independent small company and being the only full time person, I just finished an audit and <laughs> I have grants to do and final reporting. So my time has is quite limited. So unfortunately, I had I didn't get to see a lot of things. But um, and, and it's funny because if we're talking about the pandemic and, and it's, it is a time of slowing down, but in other ways, it's also, I'm just completely busy as well. Um, so I don't actually see a lot of things um, out there because I'm producing or I'm, I'm working. So unfortunately, that's my, my situation there. No, sure, sure. Congratulations on getting your piece out into the world. Thank you. Um, Great. Are there, Muriel, do you want to bring it with, home with closing thoughts? Yes. Um, I would just like to have closing thoughts from Jasmine. Um, what is the next thing? Make it like we're ready to close up. So make it like three minutes, Jasmine, of, uh, you know, what you're thinking, what your future works, what you're, where do you want to think about going, you know, who you like to thank, things like that. Um, well, I, I, do you want to say like I I absolutely adored the pieces in this whole thing. I loved seeing indigenous works and getting to experience the brilliance of everyone's brains, like the stuff that everyone's thinking of and how it's all so different and um, like calling in. Yeah, looking for Tiger Lily that I think that was one of my favorite pieces. I, I absolutely loved that. I loved the the discussion of it and um the the really raw moments talking about like queer identity and um that in what it means and um blood quantum <laughs> and how that affects us as, as native people and um i know that's something those are things that i definitely connect to a lot um and um i 
as for like future things, I'm looking forward to working on um, future projects with Safe Harbors uh, and those plays. I can't wait to do theater in person again. Oh my goodness. I just long for the stage and lights. I have like so many colorful lights in my room uh, that I try really hard to emulate stage lights sometimes and it's just not the same. It's not the same feeling as going up on stage and for me like musical theater is the thing for me and finishing a song and that moment where you're looking out at the, the lights and the people and you the music stops and there's a brief pause and then the applause and you just feel like what just happened all oh, right okay right okay next thing and it's uh, there's nothing like that and getting to hold hands with everyone at bows and just smiling that big with everyone and laughing and cast parties. I, I can't wait for that again. And um, I'm super excited to be writing again. That's something that the pandemic has allowed for me. And I, may, I hope allowed for a lot of people is to have time to be with yourself and um, to grow in in those ways and, and come back to those things that maybe you didn't have time for before. I know I didn't have time for writing um, for a while, and, but I've gotten back into it and I've been um, playing around with play ideas and I've got a play that I started writing and um, a musical that I'm currently working on, so. I can't wait to see it. Jasmine, I hope there's something funny in it for me. <laughs> um, Amber, do you have any last thoughts or with your experience or, you know, three minutes? Yeah, well, first, Mariel, thank you for bringing me along in this journey. Um, it's really an honor to like also help. my program director. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it was really an honor and um, really special gift to help tell this story in collaboration with Josephine. And I think that was what's really key is like this mother daughter duo telling their family stories like this self determination. Um, and I'm really excited to see how it develops more. Um, but as for closing thoughts, yeah, it's like this festival is an absolute gift for indigenous people to come together, tell our stories by our own wants, needs, and desires. And I think what's really exciting to think about is like what's going to be coming 2022 with the festival, um, Emerging Directors Labs. This has really become like a wonderful launch pad for Native people. And I thank you for that. Yeah, and I see all these people in here and it's, it's an honor and a gift to be here too. Thank you, Amber. Um, Danielle, you have any closing thoughts, the, uh, three minutes? Sure, uh, thank you. I, I want to say that I watched um, three of the pieces with my mother who has Alzheimer's and she stayed thoroughly engaged. Um, so I just wanna say thank you for that. And that's a testament to the storytelling and how you can bring different generations together uh, through it. Um, so I was pleased with, uh, with our work. Um, I think that I, I got so many different ideas after I saw Duke's <laughs> Duke. Uh, and I said to myself, oh man, okay. So this is a um, theater into film. So <laughs> I, I wonder how, how much I would need to make uh, our show, you know, um, Stachata, if, if, if we had that money, I don't know how much it cost you, uh, Moses, but <laughs> I, I was thinking, wow, this is, um, you know, this is really uh, high quality. So, um, you know, with the, the film in the background and everything, I was very impressed um, that I felt like I was at a theater watching, uh, watching Moses' um, his show. Uh, so I'm really excited that we can translate stories uh, of theater into film like this and have that experience. I thought it was only available, you know, in one of those high definition, uh, they, they have those high definition films that I was like, what is this? 
but now I see it. Okay, now we got to use it. That's what we need that high definition feel from from our our uh, pieces into film. So it's a challenge definitely, but um, this festival, def it, it made it a reality. And I also think that it boosted uh, self-confidence. And that's one thing that a lot of native people lack is self-confidence. And that's from uh, years of oppression. So thank you, New York Theater Workshop and La Mama. And thank you, Safe Harbors NYC for making this come true because I think that we can build a lot of self-confidence among our native brothers and sisters. So I'm uh, happy with our reflections of native voices. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to call on uh, Josephine, three minutes, uh, closing thoughts. Oh, well, I, I just thank everybody for participating, you know, and working with us. A lot of times, you know, we are a very um, small organization, although, we try to like, you know, make it, we try to, you know, delegate and seem bigger than we are, but we really are not that large at all. Um, you know, and Muriel's working full time on, on this project that we just finished, which is the Reflections Native Voices Festival. And as was I, you know what I mean? And it was great. It was really great to have people really, you know, working with, and Pam, you know what I mean? Pam was like our festival coordinator. And she was our, one of our biggest supports. I mean, literal supports through this entire thing you know and then of course i mean but i mean outside of you know the admin and what goes behind the scenes it really is the participation of, of the artists as well right and working with us and being understanding with us and you know what I mean? and not and feeling comfortable to reach out to us you know and it was a really great process in that way you know it was like everybody was you know as far as like my working mind and organizing mind like everybody worked perfectly you know what i mean that was and that was really really nice and a lot of times it was kind of you know I tell amber a lot of times like it's really nice working with native peoples because of this because there's already a lot of times like this automatic understanding between each other because everyone's wearing multiple hats like first of all this isn't a normal circumstance for anybody uh we're in a pandemic still right now and we're trying to do things virtually and then also for our organization in particular we recently lost a managing director who was more than a managing director was my father and was Muriel's husband and then that was a huge hurdle to get through you know and in August or July when we you know we were figuring out okay we have to start talking about festival stuff it was really scary it was like who's gonna do this like who's gonna look at the monies who's gonna make sure this gets out to people who's gonna make all of this happen because he was a big force behind the organizing um, in this organization and so to be able to get through it and to say that we did it and we really sat down and used these skills that we didn't even know we had a lot of times you know I'm not used to this at all but um, it was really great and and then just to have the artists to be as supportive as supportive as they have been within that process was just like like chef's kiss another another you know what i mean another thing to just make everything run a little bit smoother and so i can't thank everyone enough for that and then you know just i think of all the very talented friends and family who i have who i was able to call on and i was able to say you know do you want to work on a project and you know just finding that network of people who you meet and you're just kind of like, do you edit videos? Oh yeah, you do. Do you know how to film things? Oh yeah, you do, right? And it's just bringing all of that together was really wonderful to be able to do, I felt. And it was wonderful to be able to like, you know, employ native people and employ people of color because, you know, I know on outside of this as a working artist that like there's not a lot of jobs for everybody all the time you know especially if you're a young person especially if you weren't already like you know what I mean set up with a uh, I shouldn't say young but emerging right emerging in this industry right now is like pff, the scariest thing ever and if there was something you had in mind that you wanted to do it's like it's shut down and so it's really wonderful to be able to do that because you know you can see like people are hungry people want it people want to do things and it was nice to feel like we participated in uplifting people in that way you know like even indigenous vibrations which was the music weekend that jasmine was a part of and a few other artists it was great to hear other native people's feedbacks afterwards to feel like oh my gosh it's been forever like
like, since we all listen to each other's music, since we've had a social engagement, to be able to look at people and listen to people who normally on a normal basis we'd see every other weekend or we'd see every other month, right? And just kind of realize it's still very bizarre. We're all still doing things virtually. Like we're still here looking at a Zoom to do all of this. And it feels so strange. It's like, oh, it's the end of the festival. Like, oh, there it goes. You know, because usually it's a whole thing. It's like mayhem. Like, oh, we have to organize. We have to do all of this stuff. And it's been totally different this year. But I just really appreciate everyone's patience and everybody wanting to work and everybody wanting to work with us, you know, and you know, this isn't like, this isn't like end all and be all, I think in my mind, I'm like, this is a setup for a future collaboration. And like, I think that's something we really look forward to is 2022 and what that brings, right? To be able to have people back in person and to be able to fly people out here and to be able to, you know, sit there and have runs of their shows, not just virtual runs, right? So I'm very excited about that. I'm excited for the future, but I'm very thankful for like all the really wonderful people where we're, interconnected with in some sort of way, including our own ensemble, who really came in and pulled their weight for a lot of pieces as well. You know what I mean? When I think of Danielle and Kirby and Nick and like all of us, we all were in there like all hands in. So I'm very grateful for that. And I'm grateful for La Mama. And I'm grateful for New York Theater Workshops team, especially who really, really worked with us and, you know, tried to make sure we were out there, tried to make sure we were doing our stuff. We had our pictures up and everything. Like it was, it's really been great. It's been a really good process with everybody. And it makes me excited to look towards the future for everybody, you know, and to see everyone's pieces. So I think it should be great and I enjoyed all of it. Oh, my favorite pieces. I don't can't say I have favorites because that's rude, but I'm gonna say I have to say that the ones that I like, Blood Water Earth. Oh my gosh, first of all, blew me away. You know what I mean? Just like the entire element. I knew it was about birth. I was I was like, this is about birth. I get it. And it was like I loved it really, really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed like, um, like Adrian Harjo was on there. We told my, I told my boyfriend, I'm like, Adrian's out here, you know, cause it's like just all this interweaving of people who, you know, and you don't even realize are working on other projects. And so that was like amazing to see and the music for it. And obviously the movement of it, loved it. You know what I mean? And then Duke was like the same thing. Like, so like Duke was like, oh, we were like, this feels like this is on Netflix already. You know what I mean? Like Danielle said, we we're like, oh, this feels like a Netflix, Netflix special. And then of course, to see Nick's piece, Ugly Brown was one of my favorite pieces as well within that. I love Ugly Brown. I mean, it's just, it's so raw, you know what I mean? And that's like, that's Nick's style is just raw like that. You know what I mean? I've, I enjoyed all the pieces looking for Tyree Lily. I enjoyed, of course, like I enjoyed all of them, but while you guys are on here, just give you guys my little accolades of what I thought about it, because we really, truly enjoyed them. And we sat here and we watched them put it what on about the your mother. I did it. I'm not going to compliment myself and Amber. Wonderful job. You did wonderful. I think I told Thank you that you. when we filmed it. She bullied me for a few months there. Okay, <laughs> Nick. <laughs> no, you know, closing us three minutes. Um. Yeah, it's what an amazing experience. I mean, I wish there were this one were in person because I I would love to be in the presence of each one of you, um, because you do give me a reflection. It's kind of like how this festival's na name, Reflections of Native Voices. And for me, you, each of you get, have given me a reflection of something that wasn't available for many of us and, and to, a lot of, to a certain degree is still not available. So I thank each of you for giving that to me and uh, for, you know, and, and for work, being able to work with Muriel, Josie, Amber, uh, Kevin, and uh, which makes me a little, hurts a little bit to say that, but, um, and thank you, New York Theater Workshop and uh, La Mama. Um, and one other thing is that, again, kind of going back to the fireside chat is that um, since I am an older performer, um, I want to encourage other Native people who are older and who have stories, stories that uh, are not traditional, that are, uh, come from the, a, a place of displacement um, that begin to explore those and tell those stories because uh, those, those are important to me as well as every, the other stories that are already available. 
So, um, and yeah, just thank everybody for giving me a reflection to see that I'm not by myself and I don't wanna be by myself. So thank you, each of you. And thank you, uh, I guess, mo mostly to uh, Muriel and Josie for your, all your intensive labor for this because it was without your efforts, I, could, I couldn't have done this. And Danielle, thank you for being my director. You're brilliant and amazing. And you know, without you, this, the video wouldn't have been made. So thank you. Thank you, Nick. Moses, three minutes. Oh, I thought I, I thought I did already. Um, just just reiterating just everything that I said, just being in this space and, and talking about um, uh, our work, um, not just for ourselves, but for, for, for those watching, those Native people watching and, and, and realizing that, yeah, our stories deserve to be told and deserve to be on stage or, or wh whatever that stage looks like, you know, maybe sometimes for the time being, it looks like this and that's, you know, we're still going to tell our stories. We're going to still do an amazing job. I too would have loved to have been in the presence of everyone in this room. I know that we will um, for the time being, but, you know, just looking at this as uh, for the time being, we're looking at this, this, what we're going through as just a way to boost the, the art that we create. You know, it's, it's, it's weird. It's some, we don't like all of it, but it's, it's, it's going to help us. And we're going to, we're going to use this to, to continue to create and reach people. I mean, um, the, the, the work that we're doing right now, you know, the, at least for the past couple of weeks, anyone in the world could have seen it. And that's not, that's not what happens when you, when you, when you meet in the, in the single space, um, in the live theater. So it's just that's that that right there is amazing, and we need to we need to look at these things for for what they are, and um, just go with it for now. Because it's not going to be permanent. We will we will meet together again in the same space, and we'll have you know our cast parties, which you know we miss. Although it's funny when Jasmine said that, it's like I've been doing solo work for so long that my cast parties are often just me anyway. <laughs> so I'm like I'm always having a cast party, but I do miss gathering with 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 other artists and just having that fellowship and talking story. Um, haven't seen you in, in, in a while, Muriel, like in person. I, and I, I, I want that, I want, I, I, miss, I miss that. And the time will come, the day will come. But for the time being, let's keep doing what we're, what we're doing, making, making awesome Thank stuff. Thank you. Um, Santi, last thoughts? Yeah, Goa, thank you. And I love hearing everybody's uh, words and it's encouraging uh, to keep moving forward and keep creative and uh, uh, also kind of embracing this digital space. So a lot of questions over the past uh, few weeks when we think about moving into this digital realm is like, what is an indigenous digital space like what is the space that we're creating what's out there how can we um um you know tell our stories in this new way uh for the time being but also in the future so you know we will go back to live performances and i love being in the live space but um but also then there's this other whole realm that we can tap into and um, grow and, and find new technologies, like what is our new platforms and how how can we create uh, works that, um, as one of my friends says, that, uh, that um, leaps and is able to move beyond the screen, like in, in an in exchange beyond the screen, even though it is on the screen and that it affects us. Um, and so it's it's inspiring it's encouraging to keep going so thank you for committing to this digital space because um uh that's just a reflection of our times and probably where we're going to be headed and and you know for those people who are interested in building uh indigenous digital platforms it's um it's exciting yeah we'll go thank you Thank you very much to everybody. I just would like to do my closing thoughts and who to thank. I would like to thank Safe Harbors because without them, this would have not been possible at all. And that's everybody in administration, including my personal assistant, Shelly, um, Pam, always, always Pam is our honorary Indian. Um, <laughs> I know you're not supposed to joke like that these days, but you know, but she's uh, been with me for a good, Jesus, 10 years now, and she is always there, and she said, it sounds like a fun time. Uh, I like to uh, thank Nikki, Nick, who's always been with me from the very beginning, 
when we thought about not doing this and really thinking we had to do it and Danielle, you know, and Jasmine, who's very new and Kirby and Anthony Moses Santee. Uh, I'd like to thank my executive director, um, uh, Christina Tarrant, who took over the reins, um, Amber. And I just want to say we're going to close out with a song and um, from my nephew. And he's going to say a few words. But I just want to say I, I really the support of everybody in this room who's so worried about our family. We're one family. And we're really understanding that we're all really mourning. Safe Harbors is very, very mourning. And that's, you know, we, we weren't thinking about that. Me and Pam were talking about it, how hard it was for all of us, because not only me, but, you know, we lost my husband, who was the father. He was a founding member. He was our cultural artist. He was our director. He was the person, the go-to person. He was the managing director. And he was my husband and my, my partner. And so it's hard when you lose your general. So I would like to just go to the video of um, my nephew, um, Craig Merrick. Hello, Madak P. Craig Merrick and Mark P. Hello, my relatives. My name is Craig Merrick. I'm the son to Faith Merrick and the late Kenny Merrick Jr. I was asked by uh, some of my relatives here at Safe Harbor to uh, help share a bit of music and uh, sing a traveling song uh, to end the festival. The, the beautiful music and the beautiful talent that has been shared uh, these past couple of weeks. Um, I'm the lead singer for the We Chosen These Singers. I'm originally from Lame Deer, Montana, out in southeastern Montana. And I'm Dakota Sioux on my father's side. But this traveling song was showed to, uh, showed to us with my time traveling with my, my late father, Kenny Merrick Jr. And um, it talks about an encouragement song is what it's called. And it talks about the how hard life can be sometimes, you know, and to take courage of that. And, um, you know, we all know that we're we're all facing that right now with the, with the pandemic and everything being online, being distance, being wearing face masks, you know, life is very different today than it used to be. But uh, this song that I'm gonna share with you uh, it's an encouragement song. Thank you so much 
for everyone who came um, on that, I just like to thank um, our funders. We like to thank the Mellon Foundation, NIFA, NPN, the Doris Duke uh, Foundation, ART, New York City, and our individual donors who made this festival possible. I'd like to thank the New York Theater Workshop staff, Aaron, Linda Chapman, Morgan Janice. Um, I would like to thank Mia Yu of La Mama and the whole staff at La Mama and for viewers like you. <laughs> and of course, HowlRound, um, Abigail and Thea and the whole staff there who made all of everything here possible with our support systems. I thank you. Good night and la, 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 la. wonderful work, everybody. Yeah, we love you.